our objectives for this lecture. Well, Paul was talking about, you know, and I think we definitely share the opinion, we're not trying to create statisticians, although I know a few of you all are statisticians in the audience. We're not trying to create people whose primary job is to be epidemiologists, although I know many of you in the audience are. A large portion of what the hypothesis testing lecture is going to talk about is to help you interpret the statistical elements you may see in either papers or in other discussions. Also, as statisticians, we like Greek letters. And so I'm going to talk to you about some of those that may show up when you're reading statistical output. It's not that I'm encouraging you to read statistical output, but it's like when you talk to your teenagers. You know they're doing certain things, and some of them it's perfectly reasonable for them to do. And other things you just want them to have some good guidance and you'll ignore it if you need to. So I know every fellow I work with is looking at their data. A lot of times I encourage them, I wanna show them how to do it. I cannot show all of you how to read statistical software output because you all use different output, but I can show you some common elements. So I want you to be able to formulate questions and answer questions using p-values and confidence intervals. These are two elements you will see in almost every single medical paper that's looking at research. So I'm gonna to talk to you about what they are and what they are not. How are they commonly misinterpreted? And also, many times, people say, we hate p-values. So I wanna to talk to you about what they are good for and you know, why should I expect my teenager to be able to you know, be president of a country? I shouldn't expect things that are beyond the expectations of what somebody, or in this case, the p-value really is. Sorry, the teenager's on my mind right now, so you may get a lot of those references. I got nice pictures. Type one and type two errors. You don't know what those are yet, maybe, but you will by lunch. Hopefully. So identify a few of the commonly used statistical tests for comparing two groups. Some of this, I will admit, you need to read more in the chapter than what I'm going to talk about here. I'm going to also have you all be able to define testable hypotheses to address questions of interest. You may have noticed a theme through many of our lectures, which is it should be a question that is interesting and that is useful to try to answer. So I'm gonna talk about how we try to develop the hypotheses for those. I'm also gonna talk about interpreting hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. So this is where we're going to get into a lot of true and false questions to try to give some common misinterpretations and correct interpretations so you can see some of the subtleties. I will admit, I am worried because the language can get pretty tricky. So you have the handouts. I also have references in the footnotes of each of those handouts. And those references are to one to two page articles. They are all in English, but they all actually translate pretty well when I try to use an online translator. But you can go through and read those articles to really, on your own, get the subtleties of some of the issues if you choose to. I'm not saying you have to. I will try to emphasize what you need to know to pass your exam here on Friday, but sometimes people want more in-depth knowledge, so I wanted to give you access to that. All right, another trick is you are now in an experiment and you have not consented for it. Every time someone puts together a lecture, you have to make a decision what to present and what not to present. So a lot of important elements I'm not covering today. I am actually taking out the vast majority of biostatistics, and you may not realize that, but I am, from this lecture. So if you want a more traditional, read lots of Greek plus lots of words and examples, Read the textbook chapter, it's chapter 21. 
I wrote it with a friend of mine who is highly theoretical. There is plenty of theory in this chapter. I also have a video lecture with handouts that have more of the theory in it. It's at this website, it's about 90 minutes long, so it will be in many ways like taking this exact lecture today. So if you want to watch that one, that's fine. I will tell you, either way, you should be able to pass the exam. My information I'm giving you is a little bit different in each way, but it's the same concepts. And then you all can tell me how I can make this more conceptual and less math once I'm done today. So how do we use hypothesis testing? We use hypothesis testing in order to analyze data to find results. And I'm not gonna talk about the programs and the formulas, but when Paul and I go to school, Louise and others, when we go to school, we're learning tons and tons of different ways to analyze data. I dedicated a decade of my life, and I still do, to trying to learn different ways to analyze data. And when anybody can access this software, some of it is free, some of it you have to pay for, it seems like you can analyze the data. I'll be honest, you know, you can click a few buttons, there's a graphical user interface, and answers come out. But you have to be really careful and try to figure out what to put in to each of those little boxes. And that's part of what we're gonna talk about today. This is not the best trial, but I think it's a really nice trial to use as an example. This was a randomized trial happened in a single hospital in Dublin, Ireland. And what they were trying to do was determine the effects of a low glycemic index diet during pregnancy. So sometimes you're afraid you cannot randomize women who are breastfeeding, that you cannot randomize women who are pregnant, but sometimes you can. And here, what they were looking at were women who in their very first pregnancy had a child that was born with something called macrosomia. So this is when an infant is born too large, so it weighed too much for its gestational age. And typically the cutoff that they use in Ireland is 4,000 grams at birth, so this is four kilos. So what they did is they enrolled women early in their second pregnancy, not their third, they'd only had one baby that had been born too heavy for gestational age. And then what they did is they looked at the outcome of the infant once it was born. They wanted to look at mean birth weight as their primary outcome, and they had three secondary outcomes. One was a binary outcome, incidence of infant macrosomnia. So yes, no. You either the infant was born with it or wasn't. Then we also have gestational weight gain. So how much weight did mom gain? And I also wanna say this is in non-diabetic women. So if you have gestational diabetes and such, you're more likely to give birth to these heavier infants. They also wanted to look at maternal glucose intolerance. So what they did is early in the pregnancy, they randomized these women to either receive information about low glycemic index diets and to get a lot of counseling throughout their pregnancy, or they were randomized to essentially standard of care. So they got no additional information except whatever their docs bothered to tell them, which really at that hospital in Dublin they knew was not gonna be that much. So this was published in 2012, and there are some issues, but I'm gonna leave those aside. If you wanna read about the issues, go to the very last link um, and that will talk about those. And I might bring them up at the end if it's a good example. So what is statistical inference? What's happening here? Inference is about the population. Inferences are about a population that are made on the basis of the results that are obtained from a sample drawn from that population. Why is this? Because that hospital in Ireland, they do not want to just find out how does this diet work in my patients? We now want to take that information and extrapolate it to all women who might be at risk. And so we want to talk about the larger population of subjects, not the particular subjects themselves. And so this is that basis. This is what I meant when I used that word statistical inference. So when are we using this hypothesis testing? 
When you're designing a study, you have to think about how you're going to test the data in the end. So you need to think about hypothesis testing when you're designing the study. Remember that diagram I had? It's like really the basis for the experimental design. When you're reviewing the design of other studies, so I sit on grant and application review boards for different groups. It might be also at the institutional review board. You're also thinking about that hypothesis testing element in the study design. When you're interpreting the study results as an investigator or as somebody working on a study trying to write the manuscript, and then also when you're trying to interpret another study's results. So if you are reviewing for a journal, for example, or if you're trying to read a journal article or just interpret the news, when they tell you that eggs are good for you today, that is essentially based on a hypothesis test. I had a good friend of mine. He decided to eat eggs every day. He said he had to read the morning newspaper first, and then he made a decision. He was eating a whole egg, egg yolks, or egg whites. Anyway, so estimation and hypotheses. Analysis always follows the design. So we have moved from step one to step two. We talked a little bit about step three yesterday also. So let's talk a lot about the hypotheses and how I get down to the analyses. So what are we testing? We're really testing the effect or difference many times that we are interested in. There are a lot of different types of differences that we may be interested in. A few of the common ones, the difference in the mean. So in my low birth weight example, I'm looking at the difference between mean birth weights or in proportions. I may want to look at the difference in the proportion of infants who are born with macrosomnia, yes, no. I may also look at other elements. I could look at medians. I could look at a lot of different things. But your common ones are means and proportions. We also commonly look at something called an odds ratio or relative risk. And we're going to talk more about those um, later today, I'm guessing, and then also later in the week. But those are ratios where you have information about one arm of the study in the numerator, information in the denominator. And remember, when you look at ratios, you tend to compare it to one, whereas if you look at the difference, you tend to compare it to zero. And we'll get back to that in a few minutes. There's also something called a correlation coefficient. I hate correlation. And we will talk more about that, for sure, later on. Clinically important differences. What you want to test is the smallest difference that is considered biologically or clinically relevant. And this is something that we are going to talk more about, and it's going to come up tomorrow morning when Paul gives his lecture on sample size. Now, in medicine, many times when you get to these large efficacy or effectiveness studies, we're usually doing two group comparisons, many times of population means. We're gonna have a separate lecture on survival analysis and time to event analysis on Thursday. That's a little bit different. But many times we're doing these two group comparisons. So we're trying to make estimation. This is coming from the sample. We've gotta do estimation to get to inference. We, Jerry talked a little bit about this yesterday. You've got point estimates, which tend to be from your sample, what is the mean? What is the median? What are the changes in the mean and the median? We also have interval estimation. And this is when you start getting into that variance type of side. So when I look at this sigma squared here, so the variance, variation might be the range. It might be the minimum and the maximum values. You may also look at what's called an interquartile range, so the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. This little thing here, this is called sigma, looks like an O. Sigma squared is the variance. Sigma alone is called a standard deviation. When I take that sigma and I divide it by the square root of my sample size, I've got a standard error. So when you read the printouts, You'll see sometimes variance, sometimes SD for standard deviation, sometimes SE for standard error. And we'll talk a little bit about more those the next few days. 
But the interval that we tend to estimate the most is a confidence interval, and you'll see it in the literature many times under the English letter CI. The most common one you see is a 95% confidence interval, and we'll talk about why that is in the next hour. Now, I want to give you a little bit of warning. People like pictures. I like to put pictures into my, um, into my manuscripts. I took the pictures out of here, actually, to try to save time, however. But pictures do not give you inference. They are not hypothesis tests. They can help you look at the data, get a feel for your data, understand the spread of your data, but it is not a form of estimation. It does help you check the data, check the assumptions that you're making to see if you should do a specific hypothesis test. Scatter plots can be useful. This is when you see all those dots. Histograms are also very useful. It looks kind of like a bar chart, but it helps you see the distribution of the data. Box plots are my favorite plot of all. Bar plots, do not use bar plots. Everything that can be done on a bar plot should be in a table instead. That said, there are manuscripts with my name on it that have bar plots in them. This was not my choice, but required in order to publish the publication. This is my standard deviation, I'm sorry, my standard normal curve again. When people talk about the bell curve, this is it. You do not want us to grade your exams on the bell curve. That is a lie. But for standard normals, you have a zero here in the middle. Between plus or minus one standard deviation is where 68% of the data live in a normal distribution. The reason people will talk about plus or minus two standard deviations is because 95% it lies between negative 1.96 and 1.96. So we say two, because it's easy. Anybody here have to deal with six sigma? Oh good, then I don't have to explain that, good. But the idea is that, you know, as you move more and more standard deviations out, there's less and less probability that you are out there. So what are two of the most common continuous distributions? You've got the normal Gaussian distribution. So statisticians will write this capital N. That U looking thing, that's a mu. That's the mean under the normal. Then we've got that variance, that sigma squared. And we tend to talk about the Z statistic. You'll see Zs in that output, and sometimes even in manuscripts. That's saying the standard normal. So the standard normal, you see that Z, it is assuming something is normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, or a variance of one. So the T distribution is really the absolute most common distribution that everybody, who here knows what a T test is? Raise your card. T tests? All right, yeah. That's because it's easy to teach T tests and then everybody uses them and that's why we teach them. But I do like them. So here, what you're doing, the degrees of freedom are some function of the sample size. But the mean is basically your sample mean. And the variance is the sample variance. And you can calculate this. It's a very simple formula. And this is a good estimation, the t-distribution is, of the normal distribution. And that's why we use it, because there are a lot of very nice properties and it's actually fairly robust. You don't have to be exactly have data that matches the T distribution or the normal distribution to use them. But what if your answer is yes, no? That's called a binary distribution. So those first two, you really nor you typically, got to be careful using the word normal here, you typically have continuous data here is that yes, no. Macrosomia, yes, no. Here we actually use a binomial distribution. And so the sample size is n, it's how many people you have. And then this p, which is the proportion that let's say answer yes. So what is the mean? It's the sample size times the proportion. The variance also is a function of these. And there are a lot of exact tests that you can use, although realistically, 
fairly soon you can start defaulting to the normal distribution at a fairly small sample size. So depending on what you want to do and depending on your data, there are a lot of when do you switch? Well, talk to your statistician because there are some variations. So there are a lot of other distributions. I'm not going to talk about them, but I'm going to put them up here because people will say, well, what about mine? Well, I'm probably not covering yours, but I may have covered it in the textbook. I want to go back, actually, one quick point. When we were talking about sample size, this is where I was supposed to talk about this. There is a mathematical formula for the variance. And the mathematics itself is unstable when the sample size is under 12. It comes a little stable around 10. So if you have fewer than 10 or 12 people, animals, whatever you're measuring, in your group that you are measuring, the math is not stable. The formula to calculate the variance, even if you had perfect sampling, which you won't for that small of a sample size, but let's say you did, the mathematics is not stable. So what happens, and it was funny, I talked to people from a lot of different backgrounds, and the mathematics becomes stable around a sample size of 15 for the variance. And many times that is where people started to actually believe data. When they saw a sample size of 15, of 20, of 30, they started feeling comfortable with the results coming from the data. Now they still did worry about the sampling, about did they get all the types of people they should have and such. But I think when people say how small is too small, I'm going to attack that instead of how large is large, but how small is too small? I would say you need to be careful what you're trying to measure when your sample size goes under, especially under 15, and really under 10, because you start losing a lot of the properties. You know, I might cling with my fingernails to them at 15. Now, sometimes though, I have run studies that I have three people in a study arm, but that's because I'm not trying to make inference I'm literally trying to count, are they alive, are they dead? Like, you know, so I'm not saying that you can't have small, small samples. Sometimes I have a sample of one. But it really depends on your question. And you have to choose the appropriate analysis and the appropriate estimation to deal with small samples. It's not, you don't get the luxury. When you have, when you have larger sample sizes, you have luxury. And that's something that we're also going to talk about tomorrow, is when you do those cluster randomized designs, your sample size is the number of clusters. So I run studies. I realize I used the word patient a lot yesterday, because I actually work in a lot of healthcare settings where we are using honest patients. I also work with participants, and I work with subjects, because sometimes I want them to understand they are a guinea pig, really, not that much farther step above that. No, I mean, I want them to understand the risk and that we do not understand what may happen to them. And so, but one thing that is important is some of my studies, it looks like I have five million people, but I don't because I only have 60 clusters, 60 hospitals I'm working with. So let's talk, we're supposed to talk about hypothesis testing. Null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis tends to be always noted with an H and a little zero. The alternative hypothesis, sometimes H with a one, sometimes H with an A. What is the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis for superiority studies, think about a systolic blood pressure example. So your average systolic blood pressure on drug A is different than the average systolic blood pressure on drug B. That's a classic setup for a superiority study, right? So what's the null? The null hypothesis is that there's no effect. So that the average systolic blood pressure on drug A is equal to the average systolic blood pressure on drug B. So the mean, if I wanted to look at the mean difference in systolic blood pressure between those two drugs, it's zero. If I look at the correlation coefficient, which I told you not to use, but the null hypothesis would be that it is zero. The odds ratio, if I'm looking at some outcome that deals with the odds ratio, the null is one. 
If I'm looking at some outcome that is relative risk, the null would be one. Now sometimes we're going to compare to a fixed value. So I'm systolic blood pressure, so I chose the null average systolic blood pressure might be 120 milligrams of mercury. And in equivalence trial, you have to set these up very specifically. And so you have those New England Journal articles, and they will talk to you if you read the editorial by James Ware. He talks a lot about how you actually set up these null hypotheses. The alternative hypothesis contradicts the null. This is easy because it is typically what the investigator wants to happen. It is very easy in many ways to write the alternative. There is an effect. It is what you want to prove. But again, for those equivalence and non-inferiority studies, you have to actually do that in a special way. So the examples I'm going to give us are all superiority studies. And then if you want to learn more about non-inferiority studies, you should take additional classes or read additional articles. So here's an example hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the mean of group one equals the mean of group two. So in our study example, the mean birth weight in grams, always tell me how you're measuring something, of babies born to mothers in the low glycemic diet group equals the mean birth weight in grams of babies born to mothers in the non-diet or in the control group. That is a null hypothesis. So I assume that the mean birth weight in each of my diet groups is equal. The alternative hypothesis is that they're not equal. So I would take this equal sign up here and put the non-equal sign in there. But what does that mean? That is a two-sided test because this is what I don't know. Maybe when I give them all this diet information, maybe the mean birth weight in the low glycemic diet group will be lower, but it might be higher. And I probably care about either one. Now, a researcher would say, well, I assume I am giving them this low glycemic diet. It makes sense. The birth weight should go down. Don't I want to do what is considered a one-sided test? I only want to test that they will get lower. That also, by the way, though, will change my null hypothesis. But truthfully, if I'm giving somebody dietary advice that you think makes sense, and it turns out they do the opposite, you want to know that because everybody tends to do what makes sense, and they could be causing harm. Now, this has happened in several studies. We actually had this example in an alcohol study where they were trying to tell people in college the dangers of drinking a lot of alcohol. Well, it turns out that some of those college students wanted, in fact, to loosen their inhibitions. So they, in fact, took that knowledge, and when they did an intensive program, the outcome was that they drank more, not less. Unintended consequences. You never know what will happen, and this, my friends, is why we do two-sided tests. So there's always controversy. Two-sided tests means for no a priori, no preconceived reason, one group should have a stronger effect. Really, you probably think they do. But I bring this down to a different idea, that the difference in any direction is notable. We care in either direction. And that is one reason that a two-sided test is used for almost all statistical testing in the medical sciences. A one-sided test could be used if you have specific interests in only one direction. And if it's not scientifically relevant or interesting if the reverse situation is true. I deal with a lot of interventions that are already available to the public. I need them to know if they are helpful, they are beneficial, and I need them to know if they are not beneficial. And so I always care about the reverse situation. So use a two-sided test. And if you don't, you have to explain yourself. Every journal reviewer, and hopefully well before you finish your study, will ask, why are you using a one-sided test? And 
a lot of times they use it because it will help their sample size. The sample size is smaller. So if you do not want to be seen as trying to play the sample size game, you need to go ahead and penalize yourself. 0.05 is the standard alpha or type one error level that people set. On a two-sided test on that normal distribution curve I showed, you're basically putting 2.5% on one end and 2.5% on the other end. So now what you do is you say, I got a one-sided test, my alpha becomes 0.025. I will penalize myself. It is not to make a sample size happiness. I really, truly believe this should be a one-sided test. Now, that is a very nice belief. I'm not saying that this is what happens always, but it's what we try to achieve. Never, ever, ever accept your hypotheses. Statisticians are very comfortable with the unknown. We are not comfortable with saying, this is the truth. It's very hard for us. You may reject the null hypothesis. The evidence that comes from your study may lead you to reject the null hypothesis. You may not have enough evidence to do that, so you may fail to reject the null hypothesis. If you fail to reject the null hypothesis, this does not mean the null is true. It means you may not have enough evidence in your sample to reject the null hypothesis, it might be that you had some sampling errors, so you did not sample the right group of people. You may have had a bias sample. It may have been very small sample. And it may just be a fluke. It's one sample, you saw what you saw, and you move on. That said, one time I did have a nurse who called me, said, Dr. Johnson, We've had the following adverse events on our study, and the PI says we have to continue. And this was a study that we were supposed to stop after so many adverse events. And so we had not quite hit that threshold, but let's just say everybody had had one of these adverse events. And so we called together the data monitoring committee, and our decision was, you know, Basically, there is nobody, like, the, it's, what is the probability that anybody will not have the event? So sometimes you say it's one sample, I saw what I saw, and sometimes you say the evidence is so compelling, I'm done. But you have to be careful, and we'll talk about that in the meta-analysis lecture, that one single study can give you very misleading results. So how are we going to do the testing? First, we're going to talk about developing hypotheses and conducting experiments. We're going to talk a little bit about what goes into a test statistic and then what to compare to. So you have to come thinking and knowing, do you want a one sample test or a two sample test? You need to come knowing, do I have a binary outcome? Am I looking at macrosomia? Yes, no. Do I have a categorical outcome? So categories. It might be, let's say, marital status, that they're married, they're single, they're divorced, et cetera. Are they ordered categories? Ordered categories are like body mass index. So you have your underweight, your average weight, your overweight, your obesity. Is it continuous, like age, or like birth weight? Or is it survival or some time of time to event? So um, time until they have a soccer goal, for example. Population. Who are you doing your testing in and what are the numbers that you know about that population? What is your average birth weight in this population? What's the standard deviation for that birth weight? So I'm going back to hypertension because everybody knows hypertension and cholesterol. I have a study of 20 to 74 year old men. My mean cholesterol and my hypertensive men is it higher or lower than in people who have normal blood pressure? So this was a problem. Because why? Because if somebody has hypertension, at least in the United States, we tend to also put them on drugs for their cholesterol. We tell them to eat a better diet, the diet you'd give people for blood pressure. It in fact also will do things to lower your cholesterol. So what do you do? 
we weren't sure was their cholesterol going to be higher because maybe they're already having a lot of other health problems or is it because of how we are treating one problem it might be lower than for people who have normal blood pressure so what we said and what we knew was in the population we actually used the NHANES data that was discussed so this is a large survey sample that is done in the US we knew for men that did not have hypertension the mean serum cholesterol was 211 and the standard deviation was 46 what I have in my sample from the from the clinic is 25 hypertensive men. That's not very many men. But I knew that their mean serum cholesterol was 220. That 220 is my point estimate of the mean. All right? So that's just for my 25 men. The sample standard deviation, so the standard deviation of the cholesterol, is total cholesterol for my 25 men, is 38.6. That's actually a lot lower than what I saw in my normotensive men from this large population survey. But this 38.6, that's the point estimate of the variance. Now, you should be asking, is 25 men enough? That's what Paul gets to talk about tomorrow. No, seriously, it is an issue. But the question that comes up, really, that you should be asking is, what difference in cholesterol is really clinically or biologically meaningful between these two groups? At what, you know, I can look, you look and you say, well, 211 is lower than 220, but we need to test it. But in order to perform a test, many times I want to know how different from 211 does it need to be before it's clinically interesting. But what also happens a lot of times is you're reading a paper there's a sample size like the number 25 sitting there, and you're reading it. So you really just want to look at the test. But you should be asking, what is driving the result? So here's how I would write out this information. I've got a null hypothesis. The means are the same. The alter the, and right now, what I'm going to use is really that population information. So I'm comparing it. This is a one sample test, really. Instead of comparing a difference in means to zero, I could say I'm going to look that the mean cholesterol for the hypertensive men is equal to the mean for the general male population that does not have hypertension. My alternative is two-sided because I don't know if it's going to be higher or lower, and it's interesting either way. So here are the numbers in case you decide you want to do math. And now I'm going to talk about test statistics. So a basic test statistic for the mean, you put in the point estimate of the mean minus that target value. So if you have two samples, you have mean for sample one, mean for sample two. In the denominator, you're going to have some either standard deviation, sometimes a standard error. What I want you to understand is almost all test statistics are the same. Statisticians, we like to make business for ourselves, but we also want to make it easy. You're going to have a difference in the point estimates divided by some function of variation. All test statistics basically follow the same format, regardless of what test you are doing. Now, for a two-sided test, this is where I start to sound fancy again, we reject the null hypothesis when the test statistic is in the upper or lower 100 times alpha over 2% of the reference distribution. So what did I just say? What is alpha? This is where a little bit of Greek starts coming in. There are two types of errors that we, predominant, that we predominantly care about. Type 1 error, which we call alpha, those are false positives. And then type 2 errors, these are usually denoted by beta, and those are false negatives. So you got false positives and false negatives. Related words to this, we talk about an alpha level or a significance level. We're also going to talk about power tomorrow. Power is usually 1 minus beta. It's going to be 1 minus the probability of making a type 2 error. A quick tip. Well, first, actually, I should say I spelled out alpha and beta.
The reason I did this is, again, on some of that statistical output that you will see coming from your computers, you will see things labeled alpha and beta, and so I wanted you to know what that meant. If you are trained using European textbooks, they say that power is beta, and type one, or type two error is one minus beta. So, and this is only in like three countries in Europe, but they produce a lot of statisticians. Easy thing to remember, you want high power and you want low errors. So think about it. Do you want 80% false negatives? Would you plan a study to have 80% false negatives? No. So if somebody says that beta equals 0 0.8, that is the power. If somebody says beta equals 0 0.2, that is the type 2 error. At least it's an easy confusion to fix. Now this is my favorite cartoon this summer. This is an easier way, perhaps, to remember type 1 and type 2 error. And they luckily gave us all permission to use it, and I think it will be in all statistics lectures now. Type 1 error is a false positive. It is the doctor telling the male patient, you're pregnant. So John, how many times have people told you that you were pregnant in your life? No? Good. It was actually a common question where I went to grad school. They had a student health arena, and all people, male and female, there was a question about pregnancy, yes, no. There was no opting out, and so that made it very interesting to deal with the data. The men were not happy about this. Type 2 error, false negatives. The very pregnant woman is told she is not pregnant by her doctor. I think, you know, I guess it could be a tumor, but it looks like she's pretty pregnant. This is what our errors are. So how are we going to test them? If you are interested in critical values and t-tests, go to the textbook and watch the lecture that's online. I'm skipping to p-values because almost everybody will, out of these tests, they're really looking at p-values and confidence intervals. So what is a p-value? The p-value is the smallest alpha the observed sample is going to reject the null hypothesis. So what is the smallest probability of a type 1 error? Now you may say that sounds a little odd. This is actually, and I'm going to use the next definition, given your null is true, the probability of obtaining a result as extreme or more extreme than in the actual sample. Sounds kind of similar to what Paul was talking about this morning. This is actually Fisher's definition, and I really like it, because it's basically saying you show up somewhere, and what's the probability I'm going to see something even more extreme if there was no difference between my groups? It's normally, I'm sorry, it's typically going to be based on a model. The normal distribution, the t-distribution binomial, but there are a few other ways to get p-values and confidence intervals that I'll mention at the end. So back to cholesterol. I want a p-value for my two-sided test. My average cholesterol in my sample is 220. The population standard deviation was 46. I could do a t-test and I could actually use my sample standard deviation. My sample size was 25. And since this is a two-sided test, it's going to be two times the probability that the average from my sample is greater than, is more extreme than what I saw, which is 220. So when I solve this probability, I get 0.33. P-value of 0.33 sound good to anybody? The answer is no. So how do you determine statistical significance? You compute that exact p-value. You compare it to the predetermined alpha level. So let's say that's 0.05, but it could be 0.01. It could be something else. If the p-value is less than the predetermined alpha level, so you normally you set your acceptable amount of type 1 and type 2 errors before you start your study. But if the p-value is less than the planned type 1 errors, you reject the null. The results are considered statistically significant, everybody is happy, and they go out for drinks. <laughs>
If the p-value is greater than the predetermined alpha level, you do not reject the null hypothesis, your results are not statistically significant, and you worry if you're going to keep your laboratory open and how you're going to publish your paper. So this is my problem, though. Here I have kind of the data and the truth. All I know is the data. I know that I have failed to reject the null hypothesis. This means one of two things. If in truth the null hypothesis was correct, if in truth there is no difference between people that use that glycemic diet or not on the birth weight of their babies, if there is no difference in the systolic blood pressure of the hypertensive men and the normotensive men, then I've got a true negative if I fail to reject the null hypothesis. However, it could be a false negative. Maybe in truth, that alternative was correct. Problem is, all I know is what my sample told me. I don't know which of these two boxes I fall into. The same is true if you had rejected the null hypothesis. Let's say that p-value had been 0.0001. It looks so tiny. It's way below that alpha. I don't know if I have a false positive or if I have a true positive. All I know is that with that data, I rejected the null hypothesis. And this is the problem. We know we could be in either boat, but until we actually run more studies and collect more evidence, we don't really know how close to the truth we really are. So p-value interpretation reminders. P-values are the measure of the strength of evidence in the data that you have from your study that the null is not true. It is a measure of the strength of the evidence in the data that your null is not true. I will give you credit if you tell me it is a random number between zero and one. Ah, a tip. Never say your p-value equals zero. It may be less than zero point, and you can put all zeros and put a one where the last digit is, but it, it can be less than that, but it can never equal zero. It can also never technically be equal to one. But never tell me that is the probability that the null hypothesis is true. You tell me that that p-value is the probability the null hypothesis is true, I will want to take extra points off your exam. And actually, when I taught full-time, when I taught at the University of Washington, I did take extra points off their exam, because I'm mean. So, I was like, you've got to learn something, and at least you should know that you're wrong. You may not know the right answer, but you should know what the wrong answer is and to stay away from it. So other methods to get p-values, permutation tests and bootstraps. So I love the bootstrap. It's a great way to get a lot of estimates. This takes a lot of calculation. I'm not going to tell you how to do them, but know that somebody can bootstrap information for you. You can, however, get into trouble if you do not do your sampling correctly for the bootstrap and if you do not correctly perform permutation tests. But these days, I bet Paul and I, like, if, I'm, if I have to actually publish a confidence interval, I tend to do the bootstrap. And the reason why is because sometimes things are not even. So when I show you an example calculation for a confidence interval, you'll understand why. But there, there's some nice properties that if you take an advanced statistics class, you can learn about. If you read a lot of the proteomics, or um, genomics information, you will see a lot of permutation tests that happen. They will have like permutation t-tests. That's one reason I wanted to put these up here. And if you're in the omics world, that's usually where you want to go, some type of permutation test. So what do we know about type 1 errors? We know that this alpha is technically equal to the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis given, so this straight line up and down here, that straight line is given, the null hypothesis is true. False positives is the probability you're going to have false, that you're accepting of having a false positive. It's kind of an uglier way of putting it. 
And in our case, it's the probability that we will reject that hypertensives have an average of 211 on their cholesterol when the true mean cholesterol is 211. Type 2 errors, or 1 minus the power, this is that beta, it is the probability that we do not reject the null when the null is true. I'm sorry, that we do not reject the null when the alternative, alternative, alternative is true. It's your probability of having false negatives, and in our case, it is the probability we do not reject that male hypertensive cholesterol is that of the general population, when in truth, the mean cholesterol is different in our hypertensives compared to the general male population. So what is the power? This is how we write the power. It is the probability you reject the null when the alternative is true. This is what you want. You want high power. You want low type 2 errors. Now, I will head off the question before it is asked, what's more important, alpha or beta? Depends. It's my favorite word. It depends. Depends on the question, but this is true. We're going to talk about this a little bit more. A lot of people try to protect against something called multiple comparisons. So when you have a lot of outcomes and you do a lot of hypothesis tests, your type 1 error for every single test may be set. But when you look across all of the tests and you say, well, one thing looks significant, the probability of seeing that's actually something is significant under the null hypothesis is actually pretty high. So we may get to talking about that. But you need to really think about the health, both on the individual and population level, impacts and costs of making these errors with your study. And that, to me, is what really sets my type 1 and type 2 errors. So let's focus on confidence intervals. So confidence intervals get their own little part in my outline because they're that important. Hypothesis testing tends to focus on where the sample mean is located. And in confidence intervals, we're trying to get after this inference idea where the plausible values for the population mean, not the sample mean, are going to be located. So in general, the best way to estimate these are the bootstrap, again, go see your statistician. Paul and I are busy, but this is what we like to do. So confidence interval interpretations. You cannot determine if a particular interval does or does not contain the true population mean. You can say in the long run, if I took a lot of different samples of the same sample size from the same population, 95% of similarly constructed confidence intervals that contain the true mean. So this idea is going to come up when we look at these things called Christmas tree plots during the meta-analysis lecture. How many people take a whole bunch of samples and do the exact same test in the exact same population all the time? You don't. So here is the technical definition for a confidence interval. It will be written in your notes Nobody writes this in their manuscript, or they do, and then someone tries to translate it into English, or in your case, Portuguese, and they do a bad job of it. So this is how you do not interpret a confidence interval. There's a 95% probability that the true mean lies between the two confidence values we obtained from a particular sample. Wrong. You, again, lose extra points. We can say we're 95% confident that true population mean lies between these two values. Also wrong. As long as we're talking about things that are wrong, a issue that comes up, people will say, oh, I have the confidence interval around you know, the mean birth weight for my babies in the low glycemic diet group and around the mean birth weight for my control babies. The confidence intervals overlap. I guess there's, it's not statistically significant. Also wrong. Overlapping confidence intervals between, over these different groups, you may or may not have statistical significance. You don't know because what you should do is create the confidence interval on the difference in the means. That's what you should do. Here's an example of this. I've got, this is actually data from a supplementary feeding study of either giving a fortified spread or corn-soy corn blend 
to people that had HIV and they were adults that were wasting, they were on antiretroviral therapy in Malawi. And so for the fat-free body mass and BMI, body mass index, these are the two things we're trying to measure. And what you're gonna notice, here, get your cards ready, the difference, in, so look at this carefully. Free body mass, fat-free body mass. Fortified spread, the confidence interval is 2.5 to 3.3. The 95% confidence interval for corn soy blend is 1.82 to 2.58. These overlap just a little bit, but they overlap. So the difference in BMI between treatment groups was significant at the 5% level because the 95% confidence intervals for those two groups did not overlap. True or false? For BMI, where we have no overlap, raise your card if you think they are statistically significantly different, these two groups on BMI. And now I've scared you. If the confidence intervals do not overlap, in fact, you can say you have statistical significance. As long as this is 95% confidence interval, my alpha was, five, was 0.05. So as long as those match up, I can say at the 5% level, in fact, I do have statistical significance. So it's true. Non-overlapping confidence intervals, you're okay. But what about those overlapping confidence intervals? True or false? Raise your card if it's false, because I thought I heard it, but I wasn't sure. Ah, there are two brave women, and they are correct. Oh, now the guys are raising their hands, okay. Yes, these are non-overlapping, but I tested it. So, how do you know? So you're correct, the answer was false, because we don't know could have been statistically significant, could not have been statistically significant. I actually had to do the correct confidence interval to figure this out. Thanks, BMJ. So the difference in fat-free body mass between the treatment groups might be, might not be. The mean difference was 0.7. Using the data from the paper, I figured out that the confidence interval, I didn't bootstrap this one, but Using the simple method, the confidence interval would be 0.2 kilograms to 1.2 kilograms. That 95% confidence interval around a difference does not include zero, and therefore I can conclude that the difference in fat-free body mass between treatment groups was statistically significant at the 5% level. So, calculate the confidence interval on the difference and now I can tell you that we have statistical significance. This is what makes it also tough though to interpret the single confidence interval. So I'm in a single study. What can you say? I use these confidence intervals to give me ranges based on the sample data of what should be considered when I'm powering future studies. It's useful when I'm actually trying to figure out the direction of the study results, to try to see magnitudes, to try to see which of these groups actually seems to be superior. A p-value doesn't tell you that. A p-value just says it's 0 0.01, but I don't know if A is better than B or B is better than A. But at a confidence interval, I can see it. I can see the direction we're moving in. So. I do not want to separately evaluate confidence intervals for each group. So please, please, if you are writing and reviewing manuscripts, if you are a reviewer, do not write or force the authors to articulate, to write down in there what the confidence interval is in words, because it is impossible to write it nicely when you are looking at a single study. We are all asked to do it and we all do not want to do it because it's near impossible to do it correctly. But it is very useful information to plan all your future studies. So you want confidence intervals, but you need to use them correctly. This is your general formula. This is for a confidence interval for a mean. I just want you to get the idea that we've got this point estimate, and you're gonna have minus or plus some function of the distribution, 
Again, the standard deviations coming up and the sample sizes coming up. Basically, you are constructing an interval around a point estimate. And you're trying to see if this null or population estimate, in this case of the mean, is inside of it. So most of the formulas look similar. There are a few interesting examples I'll give folks that come up in my life. So I had this fellow who came up to me. He said, I'm practicing my new surgical procedure on rats. And I said, OK. He said, I've practiced my surgery on 20 different rats, and none of them have died. So I tried to tell them that no rats will die. And they said I needed a confidence interval. How do I make a confidence interval? I have no variance. Nobody has died. I said, well, there is an exact way to calculate this. And then there is a rule of three, which is a very good estimate. And since I wanted to leave, I did the rule of three instead. So Van Bell and Lewis have both talked about this a lot in the literature. Basically, if you have no observed events and in trials, then 95% upper bound on the rate of occurrence is three, oops, whoop, three divided by n plus one. It used to be it was just divided by n, but it's been updated to n plus one. It's a better estimate. So if I have no fatal outcomes and 20 operations, my 95% confidence bound on this is the upper bound of occurrence of a rate of occurrence, in his case of death, was 3 divided by 21, by 20 plus 1. So it was 14.3%. So he had to then say that his rate of occurrence of fatalities could be as high as 14.3% which wasn't exactly the correct interpretation, but it got him through where he needed to be. So if you ever need to put an upper bound on zero, this is how you do it. Take home for hypothesis testing. You've got a lot of ways to reject a test. The book will tell you some. I talked to you about p-values and confidence intervals. They should more or less agree with each other. However, sometimes you get the math wrong, sometimes they're rounding errors, and sometimes they're violations of assumptions. Sometimes the tests shouldn't be done and they're little differences. This is again when I get the phone call. Make sure you interpret your hypothesis test correctly. Do not under and do not over interpret them. Hopefully you have a little bit of an idea of how you turn questions into hypotheses and also realize that failing to reject the null hypothesis does not mean the null is true. Every test has assumptions. It's my job to test those assumptions. How many of y'all are clinical providers that you provide clinical care in your daily life of some sort? Some of you. If I told you I was going into labor right now, how many of you would be willing to deliver my baby and feel comfortable with it? Not nearly as many hands. So as Paul was saying, different people specialize in different things. Probably a lot of people could step up and help, but are probably better off with whoever the obstetrician is in the room who's delivered a baby lately, or the midwife. So if the data doesn't meet the assumptions, there are non-parametric tests, but those still have assumptions that are surprisingly very similar to many of the parametric tests. We talk about this a little bit in the textbook. Confidence intervals, you should have an idea of how to interpret them. You should know that even though you may get them easily coming out of your software, you should probably have somebody do a bootstrap for you to be able to look at it. But you'll get an idea of the size of the difference between the groups and the direction by looking at a confidence interval. Should have an idea if you see something that looks like an H naught, that that's a null hypothesis, what that is, what the alternative hypotheses are, significance or alpha levels, what we mean when we say statistically significant, what a p value and a confidence interval are. So now I'm going to talk for a few minutes about regression, and then um, hopefully get through some diagnostic testing. But if not, Paul's talking about diagnostic testing again in the coming days.
So continuous outcomes, we tend to do linear regression, and there may be some variation on that linear regression. Binary outcomes, so that yes, no, logistic regression. And there are lots and lots of other types of regression, but those are the first two that you learn in introductory biostatistics class. Now, I taught you what beta meant, and we are now going to change what beta means for the next several slides. When I was a statistician, you talked to me about your research study. I start seeing Greek letters. When we talk about a model, this is what we see in our heads and what we will start scribbling down on pieces of paper. This Y, this Y is the outcome or the end point. But I want you to understand that it's not causal, even though kind of the name that we give it, end point, outcome, makes it sound kind of causal. So why would, for example, be the systolic blood pressure? It's the outcome of my study. Coefficient, and when you look at software, sometimes they write it coef, or they put the beta. This is going to tell you the association. So these betas here tell you the association between some variable x or covariate in your model and the outcome y. So what are those x's? This starts getting to some of those stratification variables and other variables that Paul was talking about. You want treatment, if you have a treatment study, in your model. Sometimes you want age, you want gender, you may put a lot of things in the model. And a simple randomized study, many times, it is going to only be your outcome and the treatment. Now, when people ask about the sample size, the problem is if you have too many of these variables in the model, you can do something that we call overparameterization. It's a big word to say you don't have enough people in your study to have a stable estimate. I do something called overfitting the model. So there are all these different papers, depending on the type of analysis you're doing, that will tell you roughly how many people you need for each element in the model. The more variables in your model, the more people you need to have that model stability, to be able to actually believe the results coming from the math. So there are a lot of things you have to think about, not just do I have the right study design, do I have enough people to answer my question when we talk about sample size and power, but also, can I run the appropriate statistical test, or do I need more people simply to actually run the appropriate statistical test to trust the results? Because if you run a study and you can't trust the results, why did you run the study? Why did you put those people, even at a little bit of risk, why did you waste their time and the resources running the study? You have to think about these things, because that's a different type of ethics than a lot of folks talk about. But Christine has talked about it before, and it is really very important. So remember, everything impacts the statistical analysis, but I can only handle so much. So linear regression. You've got this beta naught. This thing here is called the intercept. All these other betas are called slopes. And I say that because your printout does hypothesis testing. So you will see a beta, and then you will see some p-value, and then you're going to see a confidence interval. And the hypothesis test is it is assuming that this beta 1 is equal to 0 under the null, and under the alternative that it is not equal to 0. That's what you're going to see in your output. So there's a level of importance here. Independence. When you have basic linear regression, or ANOVA, which is analysis of variance, it is assuming that every observation is independent. So when you do those cluster randomized trials, but you're taking, so you're randomizing your schools, but you're taking measurements on all the students inside, all those students are not independent. You can't use simple linear regression. You have to use something called a hierarchical model. Or a lot of times I tend to use like a linear mixed model but you have to use the type of model that will take into account the clustering. I have another study where actually we took biopsies from the esophagus, from the throat, and sometimes we took five or six biopsies per person. 
I can't treat those biopsies as independent because the biopsies inside a person are more similar to each other than the biopsies between the different people. So I have to take that into account. I have to use a bigger, more, more impressive model that will take all this into account. Equal variance. I assume that the variance between the two groups is similar. You can violate that one. Not too badly, but you can violate it. And normality, something that we say you have normally distributed error terms with constant variance. Again, there are ways to handle that if you violate that one. But the independence, you can't violate independence. You must go to a different model. So can I have more than one covariate? Yes. I can put systolic blood pressure, drug, male, let's say I have a randomized study with men and women and age. I can have 20 covariates if I want. But this beta one is telling me the association between drug and systolic blood pressure. That's what I want to know. And so I can look at the average difference in systolic blood pressure between the drug and control groups given sex and age. I like betas because I can interpret them. Again, you're going to see these, all these tests. You're going to see betas, these coefficients with p-values. You're going to see an f-test for the whole model. You're going to see all these different fit statistics. If you want to understand it all, go take many, many stat classes. If you have multiple measures of the same thing, let's say I measured somebody at baseline, at three months, and at six months, you must use another model. Do not use repeated measures ANOVA. We used to teach people repeated measures ANOVA because it's simple. You can actually calculate it, and I did have to calculate it as an undergraduate on an envelope. However, there are a lot of assumptions, which in human testing are almost always violated, and they are very strict assumptions, and they will cause you to make the wrong inference. You must use, oops, oh, a mixed model, generalized estim estimating equations. There are other ways to do this, but do not use repeated measures ANOVA. Find a statistician to help you figure out what to use. I will also tell you why not to use correlation. Remember that beta? You know, if I went, I could have in that last model said if somebody was 50 and then they became 60, what is the impact on their systolic blood pressure? And I could tell you on average what that was. Correlation, all I can do is tell you they are strongly or moderately or not at all correlated. It's also very easy with a high sample size to see a very small p-value for a very insignificant correlation. It has nowhere close to anything being meaningful different. So do not use correlation, just use regression. Again, I confess there are papers in nutrition journals with my name on them that have partial regression and partial correlation coefficients. This is because in nutrition you are required to use correlation if you want to publish, and the poor fellow needed to publish. He did try to get it submitted the way I wanted, so I thank him for that. Now, what is high correlation? Because you will see it. It's usually greater in absolute value than, neg than 0.8, sometimes 0.7 and never believe the p-value from a correlation test. You need the p-value to be significant and to see reasonable correlation on that point estimate. But really and truly, regression coefficients are just more meaningful. So, errors. Omics is where you start to see these type two errors get really small because people are afraid in these studies that they're gonna miss what's really important. Are these samples ever gonna be looked at again? This is a big worry. So they don't want to miss something, so they actually have very small type two errors. False positives are a problem because you waste resources following up on dead ends. So sometimes you're willing to follow up on more dead ends than others, so you may tolerate some of my early studies, some of my phase two studies. I have type one error of 
When I sit on data safety monitoring boards, and Dr. Menikoff is going to talk about that, Jerry will talk about these on Thursday. When we do those, when I look at safety endpoints, I tend to actually choose a type 1 error of 0.1. And the reason I do that is I would rather have a false positive than not really dig into something that could be a problem. But again, you have to think about this. Where is the evidence? Is this going to be the absolute last time you are doing a study? What is the implications on the science? What is the implication of public health? What is the implication for healthcare and policy? When we get to Dr. Natanson's lectures, you will see that sometimes a single study, that's not even a good study, can change the way we practice medicine worldwide. This can be a problem. You have to think outside your own lab. You have to think about the broader group in general. If it's a false negative result, if it's a false positive result, because you have to think about this before you ever start your research. And it is going to drive your sample size, it's going to drive a lot of your planning. These answers will really guide you. I used a lot of 0.05 as my type 1 error, but in reality, you go back to the studies I wrote, when I do my hormone study with 38 different hormones, my alpha is set at 0.001, and I test against that. I chose different alpha values for almost every single study I've done because the answers to these questions are different, and you have to remember that. So a place where they're also kind of, you have to think more outside the box is diagnostic testing. A little bit of vocabulary here. We know false positive, false negative. Positive predictive values. This is the probability that you are diseased given a positive test result. So, let's say I pee on the pregnancy stick. All I see is that it tells me that I'm pregnant. What's the actual probability I'm pregnant? Now, we care about positive predictive value because as doctors, and as people that are also receiving the diagnostic test answer, all we know is what the test tells us. I don't know if I'm really pregnant or not, I just know the test told me so. Negative predictive value. That's the probability I'm not diseased given the negative test results. So when I look, and I look at the pregnancy test and it says not pregnant, what's the probability I'm not pregnant? This is what you have to think about. If I give you an HIV test and I tell you you do not have HIV, what's the probability that test was right? This is what we're going to talk about. So these predictive values depend on disease prevalence. But think about it. Somebody probably doesn't take a pregnancy test. Well, I take this back. Your study may require them to take it. But in general, I'm not going to take a pregnancy test outside a study unless I think I might be pregnant. So the prevalence of being pregnant in that case is much higher than if I just made every single female here pee on a stick. Sensitivity and specificity. The sensitivity is how good a test is at correctly identifying people who have a disease. It can be 100%. If I said that everybody here was pregnant, I would definitely have 100% sensitivity. It would be stupid, but I would have it. I can say everybody has a cold. My test has 100% sensitivity, except it has very bad specificity. So specificity is how good the test is at identifying people who are well. So if I tell you that you are all pregnant, it doesn't help me figure out who's not pregnant. This is a classic example, and I, I tried to get the URL to show up correctly, but it didn't. So anyway, the classic example, one, is Western versus ELISA when they were trying to start using ELISA testing for HIV screening. Medical University of South Carolina uses this example, but actually the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, in their HIV counseling with rapid test information, they give a very similar example. So this is a pretty popular one. So I've got a million people. ELISA, like you looked at this test, I never see diagnostic tests that look like this. 99.9% .9 sensitivity, 99.9% .9 specificity. You think this test is beautiful. 1% prevalence of infection. 
That means if I used a Western blot, which is a gold, gold standard, I'd have 10,000 positives, my HIV testing. If I do ELISA, I have 10 false negatives. That 1% prevalence, however, I also have 990 false positives. So without giving those 990 people a confirmatory test, I'm telling them they're infected with HIV when they're not. Problem is, at first people just looked at the percentages. They said, well, we're, it's only 0.1%. It's not that big. Well, tell that to the 990 people whose spouses and partners may have left them, who lost their jobs, and who have this stigma attached. So you have to think about the implications of what may sometimes look like really small numbers. What's the absolute value, not just the percentage or the ratio? Positive predictive value here is actually really pretty good. It was 91%. But 1% prevalence may not be what you see in your population. Oh, and if you want the math, here's the math. In some populations, it was 0.1% prevalence. So I had one false negative with ELISA. I had 999 false positives with the ELISA. My positive predictive value is now 50%. So if I see a negative test, the negative predictive value is actually very, very good. If you are negative, you are negative for HIV. You know, I'm, I'm almost 100% certain of that. But if you're positive on this test, well, it's a 50-50 chance that you are. So this is where you have to also be creative in what your interventions are. What you do is split sampling, folks. What they said is, OK, anybody who's negative, they're negative. If you pull a positive, then go do the Western blot on all of those. So that way I'm not doing a Western on everybody, but I'm only doing it on those who are positive. And do not tell them they are positive until you're sure with a Western. So this is the issue that comes up, is that prevalence matters. Numbers look good when you have high prevalence. You want to go do testing in a sexually transmitted infections clinic with high risk populations? tests are great. But if you have low prevalence, even with very high sensitivity and specificity, you're not going to have very good positive predictive value. So when they went back and then started calculating in the United States female blood donor group, you have a prevalence of HIV of about 0.01%. You see a positive test there, you may as well ignore it. Well, you don't. What you do is you do extra testing. So sometimes your interventions or your diagnostic testing is going to be a staged approach. And then what you actually want to do your hypothesis testing about later is the staged approach. And that's OK. And if you have 10% prevalence, 99% positive predictive value. It works great. Prevalence matters. So your positive predictive and negative predictive values, you should be saying, well, Dr. Johnson, why don't I see these everywhere? Why does everyone tell me about sensitivity and specificity? It's because you need good large cohort data that you know has been sampled well. And that's very hard to do, especially since where are you going to use this HIV test? You're going to use it in a lot of different places with a lot of different prevalence. So sometimes we try to estimate positive and negative predictive value from case control studies. And typically, case control studies are used in the development of diagnostic biomarkers, because you've diagnosed them. That's how you figured out they were a case or control. And then you do additional development this way. But the formulas are very hard. And you have to still have a prevalence estimate from somewhere. And you have to be really sure that that is the correct one. Another little element that I see mistakes on is people think that they see a strong association between variables, they see a very high odds ratio, and that they have a good diagnostic test. They have a good predictor of being in a group, and that is wrong. You need separation, folks. I can have very strong association and not be able to differentiate between groups. So you need to start looking at things like ROC or receiver operating characteristic curves in order to look at separation and the ability to test. So always remember that our analysis is going to follow the design. 
I keep saying this over and over again because it's really important. Your questions drive everything else that we're doing. But if we make a wrong step any place down here, we've got a problem. So at this point, I can take questions or we can move on and I can give you questions that might be like the examination. So raise your card if what you want to do is ask me questions. Raise your card first if that's what you want to do. We're going to majority vote here. All right, raise your card if you want me to ask you questions. All right, Paul, I counted it that I get to ask the questions. Is that right? All right. So back to my glycemic index trial. So I've got my pregnant ladies. All right, before I make a mess, I'm moving this paper over here. And if you look towards the end of your notes, I think all of these questions are back there. So you can start making notes for yourself. All right, first question. Birth weight of infants. Raise your card if this is a continuous variable. That is correct. Birth weight of infants is a continuous variable. Raise your card if the incidence of infant macrosomia is a continuous variable. Somebody yell out. Okay, what's another type of variable? Let's see, is it a categorical variable? Is it a binary variable? Yes, yes, it is a binary variable. Okay, a little bit more information about this study. It's, they did what's called independent samples t-tests of the primary outcome of birth weight. So the t-test is a common test that's used in randomized studies. It gets used in non-randomized studies, but I don't recommend it for all the confounding issues that can happen. You can't put any other variables in here. It's just you have, can have two groups and a continuous outcome. You can't put any other variables. If you do, you got to do linear regression. So they did independent samples t-tests of birth weight. It was a two-tailed hypothesis testing because, again, they did not know if it was going to be greater than or less than. So it's two-sided test. The allowable alpha value, which the British call the critical level of significance, was 0.05 and it's a superiority trial. We'll get the easy one done first. I'll just tell you, when you compared the percent of infants that had macrosomnia, or in this case they defined it as weight greater than four kilograms, 51% in the low glycemic diet group and 51% in the no dietary intervention group. P-value of 0.88. Now that that's out of the way, let's look at the continuous data. If you're interested, by the way, read the article and the discussion pieces because this was not a perfect study and there are a lot of good lessons in here. They actually did a per protocol analysis. So they're not all the women who were randomized in this study. Because remember, they randomized them in early pregnancy. What happens? You have miscarriages, sometimes you can't find people. How do you handle the babies that are born early? Let's say that mom gave birth at 28 weeks. What exactly do you use that 4,000 gram cutoff? How do you handle this? You should figure that out as you're designing your study, folks. But anyway, right now we're just going to go with the data in the paper. I keep my eye on the time. So I've got the birth weight. And in the birth weight, the low glycemic diet group, the mean is 4,034 grams. We've got a confidence interval here of 3,982 to 4,086. The control group, my mean birth weight is 4,006. And the confidence interval is four, I'm sorry, 3,956 and 4,056. These confidence intervals, raise your card, do they overlap? Yes. Gestational weight gain. Mean in the glycemic diet group, 12.2, with a confidence interval of 11.8 to 12.6. This is how much weight mom gained during pregnancy. And the control arm, 
Gestational weight gain was 13.7, and a confidence interval of 13.2 to 14.2. Do those confidence intervals overlap? No. So, what can I say about statistical significance of these groups? Let's start off with the birth weight group. Here's the numbers. Can I say, is the difference in birth weight between treatment groups not significant at the 5% level based on that continuous data because the 95% confidence intervals for the two groups overlapped? Raise your card if you think I can say just from this data that this is not statistically significant. All right, raise your card if you think just from this data right here that I cannot say definitively that these are not statistically significant. You all got it. I can't say anything yet. I have to actually do the confidence interval of the difference because when the confidence intervals are overlapping, I don't know. Now, it turns out in this case, in fact, there is, it isn't statistically significant. So in this case, the mean difference in birth weight was 28.6 grams. By the way, they thought it would be about 100 grams when they were powering the study. 95% confidence interval goes from negative 45.6 to 102.8. The p-value is 0.449. So the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, though. It might be if I ran this study in a different hospital, that in fact I would find different results. If I ran it in multiple hospitals. This was an 800-woman study. Sounds huge, but it's run in one hospital in Dublin and their maternity ward. All right, now let's talk about gestational weight gain. Raise your card if you think that the difference between the treatment groups was significant at the 5% level because the 95% confidence intervals for the two groups did not overlap. Is the difference between the two groups statistically significant? Vote yes, raise your hand. You all also are all correct. When you do not have overlapping confidence intervals, while we do not suggest it, Technically, you can say that these two groups are statistically different. And then I did the math so that you could see the math. Because really, you should be reporting this confidence interval on the difference. And this p-value is 0 0.017. So now let's focus on the little confidence interval for the gestational weight gain for people that were in that low glycemic diet group. How do we interpret 11.8 to 12.6? We're going to go through each of these statements, A, B, C, and D, separately. Which of these statements best, I'm not saying perfect, but best describes the information provided by a 95% confidence interval? Is it and don't vote yet, we'll vote at the end, 95% of sample participants in the diet group achieved a weight gain between 11.8 and 12.6 kilograms. Is that what that confidence interval tells us? Actually, I take it back. We're going to do it one at a time. Yes or no? Vote, raise your hand if you think yes for A. The answer is no. Confidence intervals don't tell us anything about really where 95% of the sample participants are. It's trying to extrapolate to the population. So let's take question B. 95% of the population would achieve a weight gain between 11.8 and 12.6 kilograms if they received the low glycemic diet. Raise your hand if you think it's yes. This is also false. Because again, I don't know where 95% of people are going to fall. C, 
What the prob- there is a probability of 0.95 that the population mean gestational weight would be between 11.8 and 12.6. Raise your hand if you think that's true. You are correct. The 95% confidence interval for a mean is trying to talk to us about the probability of where the population mean might be. I'm not saying this is the correct interpretation. In fact, several letters came in to BMJ about this discussion. It's the reason the word best is there. What about D? There's a probability of 0.95 that the sample mean weight gain for the diet group was between 11.8 and 12.6. Raise your hand if you think that is true. Ah, we have learned it is not true. This is false. So C is the best answer here. This is tough. This is very, very hard. People make these mistakes all the time. So we have maybe two minutes. Do you want to continue? I have a couple more about p-values. All right, we'll continue. Which of the following statements, if any, are true? Okay, I should say, on your exam, you will only have one right answer for each question. But here, there may be more than one right answer. Which statement is true? A, the p-value provides a direct statement about the size of the difference between groups in the mean gestational weight. Raise your card if you think that's true. You are brilliant. It is false. B, the p-value provides a direct statement about the directions of the difference between the groups and the mean gestational weight gain. Raise your card if you think that's true. Again, brilliant. It is false. C, the p-value provides a dichotomous test of significance of the statistical hypothesis. Raise your card if that's true. Uh, the few brave souls who raise their hands and cards, you are also brilliant. This is true. A p-value is a dichotomous test because you compare the p-value to the alpha value and you know statistically significant, yes, no. D, the 95% confidence interval provides a dichotomous test of significance of the statistical hypothesis. Now I should say the confidence interval, in this case we'll say of the mean difference, provides a dichotomous test of significance. So I did the confidence interval of the correct value. Raise your hand if it's true. So it is true as long as this is the confidence interval of the mean difference in the birth weights. D is true. So here's a little bit. You're doing well though. The p-value part is the hardest part. So we'll do one last one and then we'll go to lunch. Which of the following statements are true? The alternative hypothesis states that in the population sampled, treatment with the low glycemic index is inferior or superior to the placebo with regard to the secondary endpoint. Raise your hand if that's true. So what was the alternative hypothesis? This is true. It was a two-sided hypothesis. So treatment with the diet could be inferior or superior to placebo. That's the alternative hypothesis. It's a two-sided test, a two-sided hypothesis. What about the next one? It can be inferred that the null hypothesis was not true. Is that true or false? Raise your hand if you think that's true. We are again brilliant because this is false. You can never infer a null or an alternative hypothesis is true. Never say it's not true, never say it is true. 
you fail to reject or you reject, but you never claim it's true. All you're doing is looking at the level of evidence in your sample from your study. All right, so while we have other questions, it's also time for lunch. Thank you very much. And if you decide that instead of you want to ask me questions, you're tired of my questions, even though you all voted for me to give you questions, then we can take those later. Write them on the cards, give them to Laura, Vanessa, and I, and we're happy to work them in. Oops. All right, take care. Bye.